This is Sharp Storefront. 20 million Americans suffer from digestive issues every day. Whether it's the food they eat or the lifestyles they live, it's not always clear what causes these issues. This quest for better gut health led Sif and Nish, the co-founders of Array, down a rabbit hole of natural supplements. In their research and experimentation, they began to realize that herbs, minerals, and vitamins have the power to effectively solve the digestive problems they were once facing. It was a true eureka moment, and from that moment, Array was born. In today's episode, we discuss the step-by-step -step guide they used to close millions of dollars in funding, why clinically trialed ingredients is misleading, and why they're investing $1 million in a paid TikTok ads over the course of 2023. This marks a special milestone for the podcast. It's officially episode 200. Without you, none of this would be possible. So we just want to say thank you for tuning in every week, listening to the podcast, following, subscribing, sharing, and overall just being supporters and fans of what we're putting out every week. So we just want to say thank you so much for tuning in, and we can't wait for what the rest of the season brings. So let's get into the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to the founders of Array. Thanks for joining. Either one of you take the question, what is the company? For people who don't know what it is, what is it? Go for it, Ziv. I was uh, looking at you. Um, <laughs> so we create 100% natural supplements that work in under an hour. Specifically, now we're focused more on the digestive health space. And what made you want to get into, of all the problems both of you could solve, why this problem? So... Essentially, I struggled with my own health for a really long time, all across high school, my early 20s, and ultimately hit my breaking point when I ended up fracturing a rib from a chronic cough. Oh, and no. That must have been quite the cough. Yeah, it was yeah. It was insane. And I remember going to my doctor, like, first of all, in so much pain, and they, they did the x-ray, and they're like, yeah, it's fractured. And I'm like, okay, well, what do we do to make sure this doesn't happen ever again? And she just prescribed me codeine. And I was like okay, that'll just, like, what am I going to do after this? I'm, like, 22, 23 years old. Like, it doesn't solve anything. And so from that point onwards, because there was no plan of action, I was like, okay, like, what I've been doing up until this point hasn't been working. And I just, I can't live my whole life like this. I feel like I'm 90 and I'm, like, in my early 20s. So that's when I got really into holistic health and wellness and kind of started becoming, like, a witch doctor at home because I was just reading and researching so much and treating myself like a guinea pig and obviously got Nish really into it too you know he well, basically like what happened is there was this massive array of different kinds of supplements in the house that we were just trying all the time just like individual okay. ingredients okay. for different for different purposes it was like immunity it was like digestive issues it might have been for better focus like whatever that might be and we were kind of experimenting with a bunch of things and what's really interesting is so Sif and I come from a beauty background in the sense that Sif was an influencer blogger writer and she was specifically in the beauty background okay. and so we were like, really like, like, like fashion Beauty or like no, like beauty uh, products, like skincare, beauty products, skincare. skincare. Okay, got it, got it. And so our bathroom had like some of the best beauty products. And so I, as a guy, was had like a ten-step skincare routine because I'm stealing all of her stuff. I'm like, this is pretty crazy. Like this stuff, first of all, works really well. Why is the beauty industry formulated by dermatologists? So there's actually a lot of credibility behind the products that they're building, and it's very targeted. Like you know exactly what to take for what specific skin issue that you might have. Like whether it's eczema, whether it's pigmentation, whether it's dry skin, whatever that might be. And then also the products are super beautiful. So like you can integrate the them. Exactly. Yeah, the branding yeah. is there. It's really beautiful. Like you want it to be displayed on the shelf. And so it, it's just so easy to kind of integrate that into your routine. Yeah. And we found that in the wellness category, that just wasn't it. You know, people were suffering from issues. Like I would go speak to my girlfriends. Everyone was bloated. Everyone was anxious. Everyone was, you know, dealing with all of these issues. And there was this almost like they didn't know what to use if they did buy things like one one two things they wouldn't know if they were actually feeling the results or if it was doing anything and also they'd forget about using the products because they just stuff it into their pantry it was just so sterile and ugly looking that no one would want to use it and I remember you know when I was a kid and I'd watch my mom with her skincare it wasn't what it is today. You know, it was still back then very sterile looking. And over time, there's been this huge rise in interest in the skincare category just because of how it's evolved and how user friendly it is and how excited people are to, you know, use the products. And so that's kind of what we wanted to bring into the wellness category. So we decided we were going to solve, you know, issues which are really easy to understand, bloat, calm, 
then sleep we launched as well. Um, we actually are just coming off of our heartburn launch. So these are issues that like, it's fairly straightforward. Like, oh, I deal with this. And it's all natural stuff. All natural gets you away from like chemically laden products, which you don't necessarily need to solve these issues. And when we say natural, we mean like the specific ingredients that are in the products is all there is. There's nothing else. Yeah. So what you see is what you get kind of thing. Because even in the supplement world, you will have a lot of these other ingredients to put in there as fillers just to fill up the capsules. Or sometimes they'll have fillers which they need to put in there to properly encapsulate the uh, ingredients, which means basically flow the ingredients through the capsules. But a lot of those products are also bad for you. And so for us, like we try to use as, li I mean, we first of all use no fillers in a lot of our products. And when we do need to, let's say, have something so that the ingredients can mix and mash together properly, those ingredients that we use are organic, good for you ingredients. And so there's never more than like five or six ingredients that work really well together. And that's really, that's really it. And also we were so particular about kind of making sure the products that would actually work that we run our own clinical trials on the products. So here's a really important distinction. People will come up nowadays and be like, oh, look at our clinically trialed ingredients. So what that means is you go onto Google, you have a bunch of ingredients, you type in the ingredient, it'll have a clinical trial around it. All of a sudden, you have a clinically trialed ingredient. So anyone can do that. There's no real uh, filter for that. Absolutely not. No, okay. I mean, that's why people have to be discerning when it's like clinically sure. trialed ingredients versus clinically, clinically trialed, trialed podcast, right? Like the whole, exactly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so when it's an ingredient, for example, turmeric, let's just that, use that as an, we don't have that in our products, but turmeric as an ingredient has been clinically trialed on its own like thousands it's actually the most clinically trialed ingredient that exists right so if i used a product that includes turmeric i could say clinically trialed ingredients because turmeric is clinically trialed doesn't mean i've ran everything my, else could be like poison so it's like a half truth yeah or it. like i and it's not necessary that i've clinically trialed my whole product to ensure that every single ingredient in there is working synergistically together you know because just because you can make claims about every single individual product doesn't mean that they're actually working together in fact there's actually studies that show that when you have a bunch of different clinically trialed ingredients together it may not be effective it actually may not is complete for some other or purpose you, you may not need that amount of ingredients you know what i mean like yeah. just because there's 15 like buzzy ingredients within something doesn't mean that they're all like doing something that they need sure. to be doing you know what i mean so was bloat your first product bloat and combos yeah. okay so in my head i go all right we're gonna solve bloat cool let's do this the four of us let's go all right and then and then you go, okay, I should probably start doing some research on what is the cause maybe, or what is the fix? And so then sort of walk, meander me through your thought process around, we're gonna go ahead and attack the bloat issue. Here are some things that are natural that relieve someone who's bloated. So yeah. we launched Bloat and Calm together and we worked with a doctor for those for that those two formulas and with every other formula. So we work with a doctor to formulate everything. That was actually really important to us because again, like if we look at a category like skincare, you see either a chemist or a dermatologist, why not a doctor when it comes to our category? So we worked with a doctor to formulate everything. And in terms of But is it specifically a doctor who kind of specializes in digestive health? And also mm -hmm. mental health. And does does everyone blow for different reasons? Every human? Or is it a certain trigger that, you know, you can you can sort of fix with something in your product. So the digestive system is actually quite complicated and you could be bloated for a number of reasons. You know, for you, maybe it's like hypothetically gas buildup or, you know, your inability to have the right amount of enzymes to break down specific foods. It could be for a number of reasons or a combination of those reasons. And what our bloat product does is it targets all of those reasons. So whatever your reason is for bloating, the six ingredients that we have in there kind of targets like different issues or different reasons why you could be so basically okay. what we said is that, okay what are some of these top top things that would cause bloat right and then and then you put all of those okay. things you put of those things all those the, agents exactly the, okay got and it. then the, the cool thing about the digestive system is that you know for majority of people there is a certain set of triggers that kind of cause bloating now there's a smaller subject of people where their digestive system really requires a different type of repair. And so there's multiple other factors in play. But with this product, we said, okay, we know kind of what affects 80% of the
of the population. And so let's go and put in high dosages of those ingredients that will solve those specific issues. Like Sif said, we have things like digestive enzymes because you may not be able to break down a certain type of uh, foods. Another one could be for gas buildup. Another one is to actually help move the food through your digestive system. So those are a lot of like, like you want to reduce your transit time in the system basically. And some transit times mean the amount of time it takes for the food to process and move through your yeah. intestines. And b before you got to this, I want to solve the problem thing. Did you, I mean, how many things did you guys try? Like probiotics? I mean, I could, I could just imagine the list of things you guys must have gone through because there's so much like science pseudoscience so many things you could believe don't believe so many influencers saying this fixed me right I, i'm just trying to figure out like at some point you go this is it this is the thing we have the science it's real yeah so again working with a doctor definitely speeds up that process because we weren't kind of going by what we were reading on instagram or you know like the latest wellness trend it was really someone with 15 years of experience who had real life experience with patients you know and when you're working with a real expert in their field then they'll be able to kind of weed through the bullshit so for me or Nish even though we're like incredibly passionate about this area we could say like oh like we like these ingredients but in order to re really be able to formulate the best possible product it's like really important for us to work with a doctor who knows their shit you know and so that's kind of what happened so for example like probiotics great for digestion right and that's kind of it, it's important for like overall gut health but if you're bloated in the moment mm -hmm. you take a probiotic your bloat isn't just right, going to disappear like that you know so yeah. we wanted something a little bit more fast acting that and would then, give and people then how much relief. testing goes into it. So once you guys had like the solution and, you know, things seem to be moving in the right direction, do you then just give it out to all your friends or is there uh, some sort of crazy amount of testing that has to be done before? Yeah, you like start each product it? takes about a year and a half to make because of the amount of testing. So actually the formulation piece is not the biggest portion of it is the testing and making sure this works in the way that you want it to. That's the hardest part. So basically what we do is like we'll go and build out the formulations by working with the doctors, what we think is the best guess that was going to work. And then we'll go and actually test our products with different types of issues. So we'll have it tested with people who have IBS. We'll have it tested with people without IBS. We'll have tested people who like are men and women. And so we'll essentially run kind of our own preclinical trials on these products to, to get some data and also just to be like, okay, this is doing what it's doing, or maybe it's not doing what we needed to do. Sure. And then we'll iterate on the product based on that feedback. Is that, is that expensive, that whole process? Yeah, it's very expensive and it's very time taking because like it's expensive because it's very difficult to do this at a small scale. And so essentially, like you, we have had to create a pipeline and, you know, work with a bunch of different manufacturers and build out these relationships so we can go ahead and do that again and again and again for every single one of our products. And so, yeah, it's, it's quite an expensive, but it's expensive and also very timely. Yeah. In, in terms of like when you guys went through the, the trials, was there anything that you either learned in, in a positive way? Like, oh, this also solves these issues or maybe or maybe in a negative way where it was like, ah, we, we sort of missed the mark. Yeah, so what's really interesting is, you know, we started off kind of being like, okay, our bloat supplements, some of the other supplements, you take it on an as needed basis. We said, if you're feeling bloated in time, you kind of take them and then you're, you're you know, it'll, it'll get rid of the bloat for you. And so that is true. But then after you ran the clinical trials, what was really interesting is like, you're actually supposed to take these every single day because over time, you like literally start fixing the digestive system. And so what happens, we saw clinical trial data that came in where after three months of use, like your level of bloat that you experience would just less even though you're having the same foods. The kind of heartburn you experience would be less even though you're having the same foods. So it's like you're, you're fixing the overall gut health. Yes, we knew that this is something that you could take and feel immediate relief. But, you know, on top of that, what clinicals taught us was that there's actually accrued benefits as well, which was really cool for us to learn. So. This whole process of you creating the bloat and calm, you didn't have to go through FDA testing, is that correct? So we're You're, a Canadian company, okay. which means that there's like uh, stricter rules. Um, and so we so have to- basically the FDA equivalent of, of that okay. in Canada, which is called Natural Health Canada. And so you have to go through a series of processes where you have to get it actually um, approved by Health Canada in order okay. to even sell these products. That, that's, so that's good. That's kind of like where I was going with this was because I believe in, in the U.S. supplements don't have to qualify. Yeah. And I'm wondering, so you said it was very time consuming and expensive to go through. But on the other hand, that to me as a consumer is, is a good thing that I know that I'm not just getting 
like you said, ingredients that aren't going to solve the problem that have like that have been clinically tested, but not together in conjunction. And so I'm wondering if you see that as kind of like, I, I mean, a plus and a minus of being time consuming, costly, but also you're actually getting what the product says it does. And do you see any any reason why like, you know, America should adopt that like ASAP? And now that you're selling in America, I guess you don't have to worry about that, but is that something that you guys are working towards like as, as an industry-wide goal? I really think so because it is so easy to build a supplement. Like you could go tomorrow, talk to any random manufacturer and be like, put some random ingredients in it. And what's really crazy is that some of these manufacturers are so easy going with the rules that you could probably sneak in ingredients and not even list them on the label. Like that is how lax the rules are around this. And so it is just so important like for us we are being so transparent with where we're getting our ingredients from who it is like showing certificates of how we're getting these types of ingredients like showing certificates of the fact that there's nothing else in here than what we say there is but i think this is more of a matter of trust and talking about that again and again and so i really feel like consumers have to make noise about it and start yeah. asking the questions and also looking out for certain things, like, for example, if you are buying from a U.S.-based um, company and they're not sold in Canada, for example, then, like, looking at things like making sure that the company has, like, their GMP certified, so good uh, manufacturing practices, that means that, you know, that's, like, a good manufacturer that they're using and they, like, abide by certain standards. So that's, like, a really good example. Or um, even better is if the company of origin is, like, either Canadian or European because the regulations are just a lot stronger stricter like we're not allowed to just make whatever claims we'd like there's serious consequences to that so whatever claims we make have to be approved by natural health canada so that is also like a helpful tip for consumers as you guys were starting this so you're in a year of clinical trials are you still working are you still like what what is your personal life like at this time this, at this point it's kind of like a side hustle yeah until you get so, to, in the very oh so, yeah so we launched the company march 2020 and good time yeah great time <laughs> um honestly though honestly i kind of a good time yeah yeah people for, started caring no, but so, exactly yeah. so everyone yeah. was at home anxious and mm. bloated um and there we were <laughs> bloat and calm like you know yeah. so in that sense yes from like a consumer need standpoint it was really the perfect storm but from an operational standpoint, it was really challenging. But, you know, I think every company goes through challenges at different stages. But at that time, Nish was working full time at a very demanding job and I was still working full time as an influencer. So like we were we were really hustling to kind of we were essentially working full time on both things. Yeah, like I had like this crazy job where I had to fly to India and Japan every single month. What were you doing? So I was in the fintech world. I was used to for a company called Paytm and they're like essentially one of the largest financial services provider in India. And this company was like on as a rocket ship. So this went like it just grew super, super fast. It went public just very recently. And so we were helping the company through that process. And so and I was the head of product for their advertising team and their consumer team um, throughout my like career there. And I mean, that was amazing and it was so much fun. And so essentially it came to a point where um, the CEO of the company was like, Nish, I really want you to go and lead product in Japan and like move to this Japan. This is when we were building Array we pre-launch. Building, yeah, like we're just starting Array. And then this guy offers this and like, it comes you know, with like a crazy salary, like moving, like Japan sounds so cool as well. and. The company's about to go public. Like, you know, this is like a very lucrative opportunity for sure. But, you know, we were working on this. And when we first tried their products, I was like, this is pretty crazy. Like, like we, it works. This is this is going to work. Yeah, like we just knew that so this wait, was... Wait, why didn't you say yes to the salary? To the to the salary? Yeah. yeah. Dude, I was well, conflicted. And Japan. I'm, I'm, I was so I conflicted. I wasn't going to move to Japan. She was, she was not going to move to Japan. <laughs> okay. And I was just like... Okay, I really want. It was like, but it's like secure. Oh, it's, it's gonna be really good. Cool. They pay for the apartment. I was gonna make like over a quarter million dollars a year minimum. Yeah. Stock options, this and that, right? Like this is a probably a multi-million dollar package, honestly. But when this happened, it was just like, oh, we were you know six to eight months into the business at this point, and, and it was growing, but we're not like making money at all at this point, right? And so I was using my salary at that point to fund inventory and whatnot for the company, but. It just came up at eight months where I was getting burnt down. We had to make a decision because I was like, I, we either do this or we do that. So Sif and I took a trip to Greece together and we took two weeks off and 
we're just like, this is crazy. Like this company is really growing. And I was like, I'm not going to quit until we hit our first million dollars. And we hit our first million dollars like 10 months into the business. And then I was like, okay, this is no brainer. We're going to quit. So you saw the signals and you were, if you yeah. felt comfortable enough to, to get out. Yeah, and yeah. Did, when you guys first launched, did you come into it with two products or was it three products? Just two. Two. Just two. Yeah. And okay. then we launched uh, Sleep and actually this past July. Okay. And then how were you guys funding it outside? Was it just your, your, your basically your, your company? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then- Just salaries. Like mo- both the yeah. same salaries. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And then at some point, do you guys open this up for investment or you- Yeah, we did. We- that wasn't, it was, it was like a, well over a year into the business though. Um, we like funded it ourselves because- it was really important to us to really understand how to build the company and not just give it away or like, you know, get outside funding right from the get go. And I think that it made us, I don't know, like very smart about things like unit economics, like understanding like how to manage burn because we didn't really have a choice, you know? And so it like forced you to have good business basics before we raised money. So we didn't raise outside capital until like a year and a year half, and a half into the into the company. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then at a year and a half, you're raising capital. And do people get it? Or are the investors like, what is this? This is crazy. I'm getting like a hundred of these decks. Of, oh, you so know. you know what's really funny? When, we, when we're trying to raise capital, so Sif and I haven't raised capital before. So the issue was that we were bad at raising money. Like well, how, how bad were you? Like, what do you mean? You, <laughs> we, we just hadn't perfected our pitch. So okay. that, that, that was story. about it. Very honest uh, when, to say, by the way. Yeah. When you're, when you're in it, it feels like it's pulling teeth your first raise especially if you don't come from that background and you literally don't know anything and anyone because it's not like you know we were in the space and we knew all these like we were literally nobodies from Toronto okay like we just had a successful company and we were like finding our way and so when when we were in it it felt like forever but I look back at it now and I've spoken to a lot of other founders it was actually a fairly quick process for us in comparison like if you look at the data behind what we did we we didn't we didn't talk to hundreds of investors yeah. and okay. have one or two of you say yes. Okay. We talked to thirty, okay, and then ten said yes. You know what I mean? And do you know why they said yes? What was the thing that they saw? Well, is the company the company was doing yeah. so well. just doing well? The company was just doing really well. Okay, so and you so, had the metrics that would say okay, exactly, look, exactly. Are here. exactly. So the, in Got fact, it. the 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 investors that we lost along the way, and I still remember like a very pivotal moment where we really liked this one venture fund, and we had like a f- our first like two to three conversations were great with them, and then we met with like the bigger committee, and Nish and I pitched to the bigger committee, and they said no, like they, in an email obviously later, but we were like really devastated and we realized it was because we didn't know how to pitch to people and so at that point that was the turning point where I remember Nish being like Sif like our pitch is bad like we got to fix it otherwise it doesn't even matter what the company metrics are doing I feel like you sell them on the dream and the story and that has to be just as strong as your metrics because otherwise they won't get it if they don't understand the industry they won't get it and so after that like you know we we really practiced and we nailed it so I think it was 48 hours 48 hours we fixed the pitch we fixed like the data we were showing in a different way and we all we did was represent the company in a different light and a different story but the company's the same and the metrics are the same and it's yeah. still doing as well can as you give doing. people some examples of, right. of like the things you've changed just so they can walk away with this saying oh interesting okay yeah for sure so i think one of the things is that we walk them through the customer journey really well so like you know the issue of why we came up with this so just okay. making sure people understood why it was, this was personal it was and personal why it's passionate like 100%. number one that's the number one thing that's that the number one i thing. look for every founder because if it's personal like you said you've experienced the issue that you were trying to solve then I know you're willing to try almost anything to fix it. Yeah, because you know the pain point so well right. that it's right. like it really for me. I I created a way for me. Right. Like exactly. I am our customer. Exactly. Like everyone else is secondary. You're an expert and you're driven. Yeah. 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 All right. Cool. That's always an ingredient one, for yeah. people listening. Yeah. Always the one. <laughs> it's always the one I look for. Okay. For sure. What's the second one? Number two is. There's people out there who will be like, oh, I want to go build a billion dollar business. They will say that because they want, they think investors want to hear that. And then there's people like us who actually want to build it, but we weren't saying it. And so I think that also the way you say, if you're going to say something like that, like backing up why that's going to happen for you. And so what happened is we're like, okay, we genuinely want to go and build 
one of the biggest businesses in our space. And by the way, here's why we think we can do that. And so then we presented like this entire kind of map around why we could do that, what products we're going to build, what the vision is, and like a very realistic track on doing that. So that was really important because there was a point where somebody came to us and it's like, like Nish and Sif, you did not represent to this other investor how ambitious you guys really are. Yeah. But to me, you told me because you're you were just really easy going with and me. And you pieced it yeah. together for them. Exactly. Yeah. So that was a really, really important Also piece. big. Cool. Super important. Oh, yeah. So that's okay. number two. Cool. What's, um, what's number three? <laughs> number, I think showing one? metrics that also matter. That's so it. For that's example, number three. Yeah. Show me the data. Yeah. So with, when it comes to the data, like not just vanity metrics, like we did right. a million dollars in this period of time, which is great, by the way. Yeah, no, but no, also things good. like what's our repeat customer rate? Like does our acquisition cost make sense? Like unit economics and just prove that like you know what you're doing. It's not just that like your revenues are high because you you bought the whole thing, you know, that like your brand actually has equity, that people come back for it, that they're buying it because there's like a real need for it. So and like what's really interesting about the metrics is that I think the first pass, like the first review of the metrics that investor sees is the most important yeah. because you can't. So for us, remember how we said we got 10 yeses after the 30 interviews, the first 20 were the no's. And oh. the reason it was a no was because these metrics weren't presented correctly. And also our numbers, like, you know, we talk about all these metrics I've talked about, but there's a very specific way to think, think about them. And so being really clear about how you're presenting them and just like understanding them completely yourselves, where if they can ask a hundred questions on every single, you know, every cell in the Excel sheet kind of thing, you should be able to explain why the number is what it is. And so near the end, we got so good at explaining because we built the model out ourselves. Right, in the beginning, we hadn't built the model out ourselves. Yeah. So the, the, one of the things about raising capital that always trips me up sometimes is if when you're doing it, you, you're, you're talking to an investor and by default, they're usually not, they're not in the yes position yet, right? You have to like walk them through the yes position. And the problem with that mindset is always, they're almost playing like the red team where they're just trying to poke holes in your business. And a part of this can be like terrifying for the entrepreneur once they leave that meeting and they have to sleep at night. They're like, oh my God, have we, you know, it, 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 can, it has a way of instilling fear into the entrepreneur. Did this happen for you guys or so, you take some you, calm and you you're know, fine? Uh, I honestly, the amount of calm I went through while fundraising, like it's just, I mean, Heavy. it was insane. Um, but I think yes to what you're saying. However, the one thing I will say is that in our experience, our current investors didn't play games with us. And so I feel like we did speak to investors who like led us on for a really long time and they were on that red team and they kind of just like, tiptoed kind of came to green went back to red and like yeah. this happens so often where I feel like founders they keep being led on for a really long period of time so I feel like you should be able to get your investor to a yes pretty quickly and like I think you can tell by the energy as well so I'm a little woo in that sense and so like I really like do believe in that but like really our investors and I, I remember one of them specifically was like I'm not going to play games with you we're going to have a couple of conversations and I'll tell you really early on and that's exactly what he did like he said yes pretty early on and then from there it was like you know continuing to go through the diligence and ensuring that like he was like fully comfortable and could present that data to his LPs as well you know same with our lead investors same thing where like we like it was like three conversations in and we knew that they were like 80 percent of the way there there was this misconception in our minds that like if one of those investors kind of doesn't say yes and pulls out then the other ones would pull out then there was a thing oh, that we were happened. so scared that's yeah. a real thing yeah, yeah that's, that's, a, real a, thing. that's a real thing if your lead backs out or they're all waiting for the lead right how big are the lead when are they closing show me the wire exactly yeah. it's like it's a real thing so by yeah. the way a tip here is that <laughs> yeah. i think have a really strong lead like do not oh, sure. have a lead who's if playing games with you like yeah. that should be your partner through the whole fundraise process our lead told us that i don't care if somebody else is in or not like i'm in and this is like a big check right they're writing like a million plus check and they're like if, if you're like, we believe in you, let's continue our process. I'm sure we'll gather the other people around it. But that was when I was like, whoa, like this is a, like, this is what, what a really strong kind of, you know, venture partner kind of looks like. Yeah. One thing whenever ever I'm fundraising, I just cut to the chase. I'm like, look, at, at the end of the day, you're betting on me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I just, and I tell them that, like, as soon as I get all these fear based yeah, questions, yeah. I'm like, look, Paul, look, whoever, like <laughs> you're betting on me. And if you don't believe in me, it's not personal, but I'm going to build it. I'm going to do it. And you're going to watch me do it from the sidelines. Or are you going to watch me do it with the front row seat? The choice is yours because I'm not going anywhere. Well, and then know, this usually gets them to go. Oh. No, it's true. <laughs> okay, it's true. Okay. So something that Nish and I realized, like actually at the end of our fundraising process, and we were like 
we're like uh, almost end of the fundraising process where we were like it was our first time we were like quite like meager almost or meek you know and I remember we were at this point where like Nish and I were freaking out about something and my dad was there and he's like like why are you guys behaving like this like you if you don't have confidence and don't believe in yourself then like w- why would someone else believe in you you know and really if you think about so fundraising true. for anyone crazy. who's so true. yeah for anyone who's gone through fundraising you'll know that it's like a lot of it is about FOMO and the way that you present yourself as well if you don't have any confidence and you're like uh, yeah. no <laughs> one really like why would someone believe in you, you know? yeah no it's totally it. I, I remember uh, there was a deal I was working on and at the middle of it I was like oh my god this is not going well and then I was texting a buddy of mine, and he's like, it sounds like you need to remind people who you are. It's exactly And I was like, that. I'm going to get that tattoo. <laughs> yeah. It was exactly yes. what I needed. I slept like a baby that night. Ugh. It was unbelievable. A good baby. Yeah, like a as, baby. As, <laughs> as soon as that happened, like as soon as we had this conversation with my dad, who was you essentially like, am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. He, essentially what he was saying is like, you guys are being a bunch of pussies. Yeah. Right? And like, that's really what we were, like we were acting like idiots. Hey, son-in-law, you know? you're being a big pussy. Yeah, <laughs> like, and we just, our company was doing well and yet we were was, acting like we were so desperate. Like, it was, it was right. like, what you say? We were at dinner and so her dad's a very... Like, so her dad's in business, okay? This guy's, like, built a massive business, and he's doing, you know, he's just a very calm person Yeah, he's well. seen it before. He's done it, he's done yeah, a he's lot. Done it before. And, he, yeah. and by the way, he's done it from scratch, okay? Like, no investment, nothing like that. So his demeanor towards business is just, like, I don't care about anything because I will do it myself anyway kind of thing. And so one of his rules is, like, when you're at the dinner table, you know, we don't uh, pick up the phone. And this is in the middle of a fundraising process, and I'm getting phone calls from this investor we just spoke to this morning. He's like, Nish, I'm telling you, if you answer the phone, you're not going to get the money. And Ooh, so, great advice. So, we were sitting at dinner. I didn't answer the phone. You're sweating though. You're I'm like, sweating. Yeah. Oh my oh, God. God. I was like, oh, drenched. It's gone. I was like, it's, it's gone. The and the dollar gone. sign's floating away. <laughs> the dollar sign's floating away. Oh, Who's yeah. going to pay for this dinner? The dollar's yeah. gone. 30 minutes later, guys, email, send me the wire details to your bank account. Here's half a million dollars. Boom. Like, I'm not even joking. That was for real. Like, yeah. for real. So your dad's, your dad's like a mentor in that way in yeah. some way or someone to just like a, a nice sounding board. Yeah. 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 So like cool. I think what I learned from him is that you just have to be stoic about business because initially, you know, when you're going through your early days, it's just you're so like emotionally. I feel like your entire self-worth, everything is tied to your business and your business is a very fickle thing is what I've learned. Right. And I think to protect your sanity and like build something sustainably to be stoic is the way to go. And I think like that's something that I've yeah, that's a real learned thing. from him. So yeah. It's I love the story. All right, let's, let's talk about something else. So in some way you're an influencer, you have all of this sort of, you know, the game of social, right? And so that's a, I had to call that like an X factor as it relates to building a product. And so how do you view it today? Right? So it's such a, a changing landscape. YouTube shorts is now a thing. I don't know what's happening with TikTok, but we'll, let's call him like the the the, the leader at yeah. the at the time being. Instagram Reels just feels like a grandparent that's about to happen. Like it just yeah. feels like they're confused. How do you guys view advertising? And again, I'm trying to do this for like people listening today in today's economy. Marketing brings some of the product in 2023. What are the things that you guys are doing as a business that you think everyone should be doing, but that you know is working for you today? I think that when it comes to social specifically people have to emotionally relate to and buy into a brand, okay? So it's really important to be able to tell your personal brand story because people, yes, like the product has to be good, but like what really gets people stopping their scroll and like really interested in a brand and like root for it is how they feel about it, you know? So telling your brand story, um, our founder story, all of those things are just really important because people also like to buy from people. They like to support people, you know? It's not just a product. So I think that age is just kind of over. So um, that is really important from a social standpoint. Anything you'd add to that? Well, I just... I think that is really interesting because I was talking about this yesterday where we have a couple of friends who've built $70 million businesses off of not running a single paid ad. And then, you know, there's other people who have built the same business only running paid ads. And so I look at these two discrepancies and when I talk to the ad business, I'm like, oh, something's going wrong. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I just got to go fix my ads. And then you talk to the other business, $70 million business. She's like, I just got to go create a bunch of more TikToks. And so what's really interesting is in, in that world, there's generally we're in a really interesting time where there's there's venues to be able to get to people in, in, in two different ways, like really effectively. And I think that especially when it comes to the social stuff, like I've, I've been learning from this person a little bit and like 
they're taking every opportunity to showcase what it's like to be part of this business, yeah. right? Even with us as an example, you know, we want people to know who is on the team, the names of the people on the team, what each person is doing, what the behind the scenes of working at Array is like. We just bought a um, Array headquarters where it's not, not an office. Rent. Sorry, we didn't buy. We, yeah, we rented a place where it's uh, like people are going to come in and have a space just like you guys have over here, hot, cold, sauna, um, therapy, all this kind of stuff, and you can work out of there. And it's like, you know, this is the kind of stuff that gets people excited, whether it's you're attracting talent, whether it's like people getting to know what it is that you work with, because, you know, this is not corporate America. This is like a startup, and also startups have a bad name in a certain ways as well, because people are so exposed to the, you know, tech startup situation where it's like offices and there's like a lot of parties and whatnot. But then you have this scenario here where, we are building this team where they genuinely are so excited to work with us. People are coming into the office, which is like a home where they get to, you know, live a very natural life of theirs. And people really resonate with that because that's very real. And so I think that being able to showcase that through social media is like such a powerful tool. And are you guys doing that today through TikTok or what, what, like what's TikTok, your avenue Instagram, of choice? Instagram stories, like all, all, all fronts. All the time. Yeah. Yeah. And mostly just you guys sharing your personal story or is it? No, it's it's also our team, right? Like we like if right, Nish right. and I are not available, like th there's a lot of behind the scenes that's always shown. Um, yeah. Like any any chance that we get where something interesting is happening, like it's it's being showcased. It's not just around Nish and I. It's it's about also sure. like the brand beyond us. Do you have a cool story where a certain TikTok landed you X amount of dollars or something like that? Well, actually, uh, we launched our TikTok channel like June 2020. So it's still pretty early. And our first viral tiktok was um niche in the video with like a bunch of labels being printed and that went viral on tiktok back then and we got such an outpouring support from like people and like just like buying the product and then we'd see like people reviewing the product on tiktok because it was like tiktok made me buy it type thing yeah. so that was really cool that was before we had like measuring abilities but like it was just no, we kind saw, of like, uh clear as yeah clear at yeah that time too and it was a video that had nothing to do. Like, we didn't even talk about the company. It was just me. Just the labels? Yeah, it yeah, was, it was, it was like, just you know like a small printers? business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, you know the like, label printers that says print labels because sure. you're packaging at home? Yeah. And so I, like, it's literally in our apartment. I'm sitting there being like, there's so many things to pack. Like being super grateful, ah, but at the same time, it's yeah. just like printing hundreds of right. labels. And people are like, wow, this is crazy. And then that, that made them and support then they're curious us even more. The, why yeah. so many people are ordering right. it. Like, what am I missing out yeah, on? Yeah, and right. like I think also people like to support small businesses you know and so we were really just showing the behind the scenes of what it's like to build a small business and like everything that goes through your head which is like you're so grateful but then there's so many challenges along the way and it's like so you know you're you're pulled in like these two it's you oscillate so much between the highs and the lows when you're like a brand new business so yeah. something you touched on before so you have two friends one built with no ads one's built business with ads at some point you have to, you have, you have to have a vote, right? Or at least you have to think about like, how do you think about that? So if you put, if I put both of them in the room, when it comes to these two people, I think like one is very creative and the other one probably isn't. Is that spot yeah, on? Yeah, yeah. Spot on. Yeah. Spot on. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and, and Nish, you can, you can also, you know, add into this, but I think both of us are probably in the same line of thinking where like, I think that in order to build a really like large business, it has to be a combination of the two, both tap out at certain points, you know, especially like right now with iOS changes, I don't think you can build like a billion dollar business on just ads anymore, you know? So I think it has to be a blended approach. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, like this is exactly why we decided to work together. Yeah. Like, I think one of my favorite things is just watching some of the biggest businesses in the world are ones where the, the founders are completely different than one another. Like you have one person with a completely opposite skill set and interest and just a, a spike in ability to do things in the other than the other person. And then when you bring those people together, yeah. that is always where the magic happens. I think business is, is art in that way. And I don't, I don't think a lot of people understand that, but it's like if when I think about like an album or a real estate development project, I think people just see like, oh, some a, a contractor used materials and built a box. And like what I see is you had maybe a team of four architects. You had a team of maybe 10 engineers. You had a team of artists. You had a team of someone sourcing materials. And at the end, it's like really a symphony. Mm -hmm. And when people come in, they know if they like the sound or not by how they feel. But that's a very woo-woo thing to say to, some, but it's real. to, to most yeah. real estate developers who use an Excel sheet. They're like, what is that? What does that Excel sheet tell me? And I think, I, I think, but that's what I love about business in general is, is what I've learned is the more people you bring to the table, 
And the more they're able to sort of bring their strengths, the better everything is. Everything. Yeah. 100%. Exponentially. 100%. And it's like, it's just such a better, per- yeah, I love it. Nish, can you clarify what you mean when you say businesses that only rely on social media versus businesses that rely on ads? Are you talking about like traditional advertisement and media? or Yeah, I'm talking about like spending money on direct response advertising. Okay. So I'm talking about things like Got Facebook it. ads, Instagram ads, TikTok ads, um, TV ads. Like you are putting out an ad for direct response advertising. Got it. I bring this up because I read uh, an article that just came out recently where you uh, were quoted as saying that Array is going to be spending just shy of a million dollars on TikTok ads in the in the coming year. Like, what was that switch like for you going from organic posts to like putting down a serious chunk of change on? sponsored posts and advertisements within that platform so now that i've been in the advertising industry for a while you learn that over time things only get more and more expensive and so when you see an opportunity where it's like the the cpms basically um how much it costs for a thousand people to see your ads so when those cpms and tiktok are so low they're like one tenth of what they are on Facebook and maybe they're, they're not like that right now. They're still cheaper. But when you see the opportunity, you have to really make use of that. And so the reason we're doing stuff like this is because I know that this is only going to get more expensive. And even if you spoke five years ago when it wasn't that expensive, people were still talking about how expensive it was. And so every platform is going to continue to get more expensive. But if there's an opportunity to be able to, you know, do this in a profitable way, then we want to maximize that opportunity as much as possible. And as early as possible. As early as possible. I think about this with like Facebook ads. So people people who need like a real thing and Facebook ads in 2010, I could like literally advertise to you. I, I knew everything about you and Facebook let you do that. You know, you could be like an 18 year old who lives in this zip code, allegedly likes these books, plays soccer, like I could literally have yep. an, today. You can't do that. No, you can't. Which is crazy that it's you insane. could back then. Yeah, and so I hear that point. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's just like there's. I have friends who've built fifty million dollar revenue businesses on just Facebook ads, and that's you can't do that today. You just can't do that today. And so the playbook has changed entirely. And so you know, if we can even do half of that today with uh, just that kind of advertising, then why wouldn't you? Because five years from now, you may not be able to do half of that. You might be only able yeah. to build a $5 million business right. profitably yeah. on Diminishing these advertising returns. Channels. Exactly. Or, or I think the ultimate example is TikTok might be banned in five or years. Or might be banned. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. That's the other <laughs> yeah. kind of reality. When it comes to what's next for you guys as in terms of products, you know, what can you tell us? We're focusing heavily on the digestive health space. And even say, for example, you look at Common Sleep. Um, the reason we have those two products is because it helps with digestion as well. We just don't see it that way. For example, like when we are anxious, bodies go into fight or flight mode, which makes digestion really hard. Similarly with sleep, if you're getting bad sleep, you're not eating the right things, like your digestive system has slowed down significantly. So right now our product trajectory is like way more digestive health focused. So like really just focusing in on niche issues. So we just launched Heartburn actually just this week. And that's such a niche issue within the digestive health category that people are just popping Pepsi and Tums, right? But they don't really have necessarily a cleaner alternative. And so that's what we wanted to provide to them. Okay. So it's a cleaner alternative of those two things. Yeah. And then we have like other things coming as well, but like digestive health is. Yeah. I mean, it's just that we've, you know, we've kind of been able to do a lot of research in this space. And so because we've been in this space so much, I think we understand like the health issues in, in like the body of the digestive, like your gut, like very well. And so essentially we want to be able to solve these problems for the majority of people by providing them the right combination of supplements or the right combination of, or the right individual supplements for whatever they're dealing with. And I just think that like that way we actually have the credibility and right to do that because first of all, we've been doing this for for a couple of years. And also on top of that, we have the people and the doctors and the mechanisms to be able to help with that. So we just want to be able to help people in this space. And you know, the, the gut is the core of a lot of where these issues start from. And so we just want to keep doubling down on that. I love it. Where can people buy your product? Array.com. Array.com. Will you guys go to stores soon? Anytime? Is, is that something? We're at Arrow One already in Great. LA. And then we're at like a number of practitioners offices, um, like different doctors offices and um, like beauty boutiques. But our biggest one is Arrow One right and now. And how much does one of these uh, look, like give people a sense of how big, how many things are inside and how much the cost? Yeah. So we're basically at a uh, 30 day supply. So all, all of our products are at 30 day supply. And 
usually the price for each one is $48. And you can go for a higher supply. You can go for a 45 or 90 day and 180 day supply for the blow capsules example. And the price per serving obviously becomes cheaper the more you buy. But yeah, on average, they're about $48. The Heartburn product is $40. But we always give people a 30 day supply. And I imagine there's a subscription component yes, to all this also that people yes. can sign up for. Some yeah, sort so if of you loyalty. subscribe, you get 10% off and free shipping. And that really saves you quite a lot of money, actually, especially shipping costs are insane these days. But and then also subscribers, they have a bunch of perks. Like we really value the subscribers and we really treat them very, very well. And so, you know, you get a bunch of perks. Like, for example, we get Sif, why don't you talk about the person with them? Um, yeah, we have like essentially anytime we do PR mailers, you have a chance at getting them. So there's like a lot of different things that we do. Like we have events for our VIP customers where like, you know, we have dinners with our customers. They get to hang out with us. Like there's like a lot of things that we do, like community building efforts as yeah, well. Yeah, that's so intelligent. Well, look, thank you guys for coming on the podcast. I yeah, appreciate thank it. You. Thank really you appreciate guys. this conversation. This was course, so yeah, fun. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Hey, you. Yeah, you listening. Thank you so much for making it to the end of the episode. Make sure to follow us on Instagram, subscribe on YouTube, and we cannot wait to see you next week for another great episode. Cheers.